All right, switching gears now to the Safavid Empire. The Safavid Empire was based in Iran, or as it was called then, Persia. It included an impressive amount of territory, including Iraq, Georgia, the country, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. The borders of modern-day Iran are basically the area that was continuously claimed and run by the Safavids. It resembled the Ottomans in the fact that it was also a military-based empire, it was heavily dependent on cavalry, land grants, and had a cosmopolitan, diverse population. However, the Safavids differed in one very important way, thanks to the founder, Ismail. Shah Ismail I was the founder of the Safavid Empire, beginning in 1502. While originally his family lineage had been Sunni Muslims, Ismail declared his nation would be Shiite Muslims. This makes them unique. Basically, all of their Islamic neighbors were Sunnis. Sunnis were much more powerful when the Safavids were starting out. So why did he declare the Safavids to be a Shia empire? Well, the Safavids were a Sufi order of Islam that dates back to the mid-13th century. I mentioned in the Ottoman lecture about a Sufi sheikh who had interpreted Osman's dream. Well, they are very kind of academic, um, but they're sometimes described as being mystical. They're not really a sect of Islam, but they're an order, an, Islam, uh, an Islamic order, basically. Uh, the leader of the Safavids way back in the mid-13th century had converted to Shiism, and the Safavid Brotherhood grew into not just a religious group, but a military one. And in 1501, the Safavids declared their independence when the Ottomans outlawed Shiism. And this caused many soldiers in the Janissary army to actually flee the Ottomans and joined the Safavids. That made them uh, very, very strong, right? Getting those, some of the best soldiers in the world. All right, so taking this course made a huge division between the Safavids and the Ottomans and the Mughals, whose empires basically sandwiched them in. In terms of governance, there's another big difference. Shah Abbas I, the most renowned Safavid Shah who ruled over 50 years, from 1587 to 1629, named Isfahan to be the capital city in 1598. Shah Abbas focused the city on the giant royal plaza, which doubled as a polo field and as a place for him to review his troops. Isfahan was not located on any sort of a sea, and it was further inland. It was only occasionally visited by European traders. If they came, though, they would be rewarded in seeing the elaborately decorated Isfahan Mosque. The background of these slides of the Safavid Empire is all uh, the ceiling of, or the dome of the Safavid Mosque. The Safavids produced some of the greatest art and architecture in the world, and the Isfahan Mosque is today recognized as a United Nations World Heritage Site. Its internal nature, away from the sea, made it a fairly well-protected place, and in fact, no shahs were ever assassinated. While Isfahan is ostensibly the capital city in the course of its history, Iran had about 12 capital cities. Today's capital city of Iran is Tehran. Basically, the capital was wherever the Shah was out on military campaigns. Now, Shah Abbas I's grandson, Abbas II, ruled for 24 years, 1642 to 1666. During his reign, the empire reached its height in terms of revenue, territory, and military might. It's interesting to note, though, that when he took the throne, he was only nine years old. So in his place, while he was underage, his mother, Anna Kanum, ruled in his stead. Now, she didn't rule by herself. Technically, there was the Grand Vizier assisting her, as well as two other advisors named Muhammad Ali Khan and Johnny Khan Shamlu, who basically kind of all ruled together as rulers until Abbas II came of age. Basically, though, Anna Kanum with the Grand Vizier ruled, and a French trader going through in 1645 basically said she governed Persia. And there's going to be some drama within this circle of leaders. In fact, I think it was Johnny Khan Shamlu who basically called out the Grand Vizier and executed him. And then the royal, like, wine guy, the guy who supplied the wine, uh, called out uh, Johnny Khan Shamlu for what he had done. And then he was executed. The, the Johnny Khan Shamlu, not the wine guy. Yeah, lots of drama going on there. 
Anyway, she died in 1647. Eventually, Abbas II takes over. Once he took power, Abbas II waged war against both the Mughals and the Russians over certain territories. The war took territory from the Mughals, Kandahar, but the fight against the Russians over the Caucasus was less successful. Despite these wars, the empire was remarkably stable up to a point, and that is because of the system of primogeniture. Primogeniture is the idea that we usually see in Western society. It's pretty familiar to us. The eldest son basically receives all of the inheritance, or basically power is passed on to the eldest son. You might remember way back when talking about Prince Henry the Navigator of Portugal. He was the third born son, so he wasn't as likely to wind up to be king. That's why he devoted his life to the school of navigation. Anyway, the Ottomans, the rival empire, they do not do primogeniture. It's brother versus brother. Whoever survives gets to rule, and whoever rules gets rid of his brothers. In the Safavid Empire, they have a kind of a primogeniture from a Persian tradition whereby the son follows the father. So again, this is going to bring some stability. Now, similar to the harem, the Safavids have a space for women. It's called the Andarun. Women were seldom in public, but the Andarun was a place separate from the public rooms of a house or the palace. Behind these closed doors, however, women were actually very active in real estate, buying and selling estates and property. Unlike European laws, women could retain property after marriage and could influence affairs of state, as in the case of Shah Abbas II's mother, Anna. The Safavids lacked some diversity that was in the Ottoman Empire. The population was significantly smaller, about 8 million at its peak, and many of them were nomadic people. This is due mostly to the fact that most of Iran is a desert with a few oases. So there's these vast unpopulated spaces, or there were these vast unpopulated spaces, and while the territory was under the control of the Safavids, there really weren't that many people there. It's kind of like Wyoming. Big open space, not a lot of people. Iranians, Turks, Kurds, and Arabs called the empire home, but heading into the 18th century, there was trouble brewing. A number of factors assisted the collapse of the Safavids. Officially, the Safavids were overthrown in 1722 when a band of Afghans invaded Isfahan and took it. But how was a small force able to overthrow an empire? Well, the seeds of the collapse had been sown for some time. Until the discovery and exploitation of oil, Iran was pretty much lacking in resources other than tea, silk, and carpets. Now, tea and silk, although they were very sought-after goods, especially moving into the 18th century, right? England loves tea. Europe loves tea. They're going to want to trade for that. But the trouble was that a series of droughts and famines hurt the tea trade, and they also needed to feed people. So they have to look for other sources of revenue. And when you're competing with India, that's pretty difficult. Remember, Isfahan is very hard to get to. India, man, they, they've got it down to a science. As previously mentioned, the small population was largely nomadic, and that made them harder to control. The Safavids lacked the same bureaucratic controls on the population that the Ottomans had over their population. This also meant that it was hard to collect taxes from them, which meant that funding the empire became all but impossible, especially considering the issue of resources. There was a delicate balance of revenues and expenditures, which was going to lead to some of the biggest forms of corruption, at least as it related to currency. In the late 16th century, the inflation caused by cheap silver spread into Iran. Then, overland trade through Safavid territory declined because of the mismanagement of the silk monopoly after Shah Abbas's death in 1629. So later shahs couldn't pay their army or the limited bureaucracy. In fact, the last two Safavids were probably the weakest leaders, and not just because they didn't have money, but because they didn't have as much experience and had lived sheltered lives in the Andarun. Anyway, so there's no money to pay the armies. And I don't know if you know this, armies don't like to not get paid. And this inflow of silver was coming from the New World. In some of the treasuries, officials will try to tamper with coins. They'll use different levels of silver in an effort to gain some sort of control over the inflation. But this sort of corruption and subterfuge was a short-term solution to a long-term problem. The inability to pay the army, which was now more or less out of practice, plus the lack of support from the nomadic population, made the military collapse not inevitable, but not a surprise. So in 1722, a small band of rebel Afghans invaded Isfahan, took it, and effectively ended Safavid rule. And that's where we'll put a pin on the Safavids, 
But believe me, this is not the last we're going to hear about Iran. The next lecture is going to focus on the Mughal Empire. Stay tuned.